Chapter 8. The crew carried Derek Badger to his motor coach, dried him off, bundled him in a fuzzy expedition survival bathrobe, and put him to bed. Raven Stark stayed to fuss over him. I thought we'd lost you this time, she said. Where's my green tea? he asked irritably. The director popped in. He said the trucks were being loaded to go. Derek displayed the raw scrapes on his knees and a scabby lip. This is all your fault. The, the director thought, I'm not the clan who climbed on the alligator's back. Raven said, the most important thing is that nobody got seriously hurt. No, the most important thing is my show, Derek snapped. <clears throat> he was trying to sound tough, but it was just an act. The tussle with the reptile had frightened him. He had truly thought he was going to drown or be devoured. Over the years, there had been other mishaps while staging wildlife encounters, yet nothing as harrowing as his encounter with the swamp beast called Alice. By the way, Derek said to the director, consider yourself fired. I brought something to show you. A letter of resignation, perhaps? Oh, the director held up a disc. The pond scene, he said. Destroy it immediately. Not so fast, the director said. Derek glowered. Are you threatening to blackmail me? He looked over at Raven and snapped. You're my witness. Obviously, he wants a payoff. Just chill out, the director said. He inserted the disc into a DVD player that was mounted on a high under a high-def TV. Derek motioned for Raven to fluff his pillows. He said, let him have his fun and be on his way. Raven sat on the edge of the bed to watch the scene. She was prepared to be depressed. Her boss, the executive producer of Expedition Survival, would be furious to learn that Everglades episode was being scrapped. It cost big money whenever something like this happened because the director and crew still had to be paid. On one memorable occasion, Derek had leaped from a, a baobab tree in Madagascar and sprained both ankles. The script hadn't called for him to jump. A baby gecko had scurried up his shorts and frightened him. On another set in Mexico, Derek had clumsily tripped over a tortoise and sprawled into a yucca plant. His face had swollen up like a puffer fish. For two weeks afterward, he had worn a veil and refused to go out in public. While shooting a program in Australia, a very expensive trip, Derek had ignored the local wrangler's warnings and tried to tackle a wallaby, which he'd hopped, hoped to fry up as one of his televised campfire dinners. The result? Five broken ribs, a torn Achilles tendon, 16 stitches in his scalp, and five days in the hospital. In each instance, filming had to be canceled and the expenses settled. Raven knew that if Expedition Survival had been such a smash hit, hadn't been such a smash hit, Derek would have been booted off the show a long time ago. Let's get this over with, she said to the director. He pressed the play button on the DVD console. 33 seconds later, he turned it off. Raven took a heavy breath. Derek sat bolt upright and goggle-eyed. Well, the director said, that was bloody brilliant. Derek punched the air jubilantly with both fists. I almost died, didn't I? That vicious monster almost killed me. Witnessing the scene all over again, even on a video disc, had left Raven a bit shaken. The director said, do you still want me to destroy it? Derek roared, destroy it? Are you crazy, mate? This stuff is killer. This is genius. Am I right, Raven? Is this not the bomb? The bomb it is, Raven said quietly. That crazy redneck. Did you see what he did? A total madman, the director agreed. Derek lowered his voice. Can you edit him out of the scene? No problem. Snip, snip. Excellent, Raven said, but he saved your life, Derek, and he shall be compensated handsomely. With a hopeful smile, the director asked, does this mean I'm not fired? Fired? Ha! Derek bounded from the bed and threw an arm around the man's neck. You, my friend, just got yourself a big fat raise. As Wahoo and his father had predicted, Susan Cray knew exactly how much the family owed the bank for overdue mortgage payments. $7,912.04. Don't forget, I just sent him 800 bucks, Mickey said. Yes, honey, I already subtracted that. Oh, we're almost two months behind on your truck, she said. You sure about that? May I speak to Wahoo? 
He's right here, Mickey handed the phone to his son. Sorry, we woke you, Mom. How's the job going? Not so great. What happened? Long story, Wahoo said. Too long for an expensive overseas phone call. How's China? I'm homesick, big guy. Is your dad feeling okay? Tell the truth. Some days are better than others. Susan Cray sighed. He's as stubborn as a darn mule. You keep an eye on him. I'm trying, Wahoo said. Somebody knocked on the door and Mickey went to open it. Let me talk to him again, said Wahoo's mother. He'll call you back, Mom, when it's daytime over there, I promise. Derek Badger and Raven Stark were standing in the living room. Wahoo said goodbye to his mother and set, the set down the phone. Then he told his father to put away the fire extinguisher. I'm serious, Pop. But they're supposed to be gone. Raven said, we need to chat, Mr. Cray, please. <clears throat> I don't chat. He put, pulled the trigger on the fire extinguisher, blasting a cloud of white vapor toward the ceiling. Now get out! Knock it off, said Wahoo. Derek puffed his chest. Mate, there's no need to be cranky. We come in peace. It was hard to take the man seriously because he was dressed in a purple bathrobe and matching slippers. Mickey placed the fire extinguisher on the kitchen counter. Wahoo suggested that everybody sit down, which they did. Raven said, Derek's got something he wants to say. <clears throat> Imagine that. Mickey was rubbing his temples. Derek leaned forward. That wrestling scene with the alligator. Alice is her name. Yes, Alice. The scene turned out fabulously, Mr. Cray. Perhaps the most extraordinary 33 seconds of footage in the history of expedition survival. But you almost got drowned. Exactly. And the best part is, it was real. You're seriously going to use that in your show? Mickey asked, and the right away Wahoo knew what his father was thinking. Of course we intend to use it, Raven said. It'll be all over YouTube the same night, Derek added. Trust me, we're talking worldwide viral. Millions of hits. Mickey's eyes narrowed. That means you're going to pay us the rest of the money, right? Derek chuckled. Not only are we going to pay you all of it, we're hiring you to lead us into the Everglades to put the finishing touches on this masterpiece. What do you think of that? Wahoo felt slightly queasy. What do you need me for? His father said to Derek. You're going to fake the rest of it, same as you always do. Derek didn't seem even slightly insulted. He twirled the sash on his robe and said, You're the most fearless man I've ever met, Mr. Cray. With you guiding us on location, we won't need to fake anything. In our line of work, Raven cut in. It's known as recreating events for the camera. Wahoo spoke up. He can't go. He's got another job lined up that starts tomorrow. Mickey threw him a puzzled look. What job? You know, Pop, that scorpion scene for the Rainforest Channel. Wahoo was hoping his dad would get the hint and play along. A swamp trip with Derek Badger promised nothing but trouble. Mickey scratched his head. I don't remember booking a scorpion gig. And even if you did, Derek said with a wink, will it pay you $2,000 a day for four days? Wahoo was stunned. With that kind of money, they could cover what they owed on the house and the truck. His mother wouldn't have to give a nickel of her China paycheck to the bank. Hold on, what about the boy? Wahoo's father said to Derek. He's my right hand. <clears throat> then make it 2,500. Plus, we'll give him screen credit as first assistant wrangler. Mickey stroked his chin. Let me think on this. <clears throat> Derek looked aggravated. Are you serious? This is the opportunity of a lifetime. Wahoo didn't know whether he should be flattered or suspicious that Derek had agreed to put him on the payroll. $500 a day was more money than he'd ever made on any job. He was also secretly excited at the idea of seeing his own name among the crew credits that would roll on the screen at the end of the broadcast. Yet, while part of him wanted his dad to accept Derek's offer, another part of him feared something bad would happen. The real Everglades was a very different place from the homemade marsh in the Cray's backyard. Feeling torn, he excused himself from the meeting and jogged down to see about Alice. She was still pouting, only her black nostrils showed on the surface of the pool. Wahoo sat down on a plastic milk crate and watched a baby leopard frog hop across the lily pads. Soon, a piece of pale, ragged cloth floated to the top of the water. 
Well, who used the bamboo bamboo pole to retrieve it? <laughs> Derek's torn khaki shorts. Two large hollow alligator incisors remain stuck in the fabric. You'll grow new ones, Wahoo said to Alice. The average gator went through 3,000 teeth in a lifetime of chomping. Yeah, she'll be pretty as ever. It was his father who'd come up behind him. And she knows it too. What did you tell him, Pop? You mean the dorkster? Mickey Cray smiled. He showed me the video. They put it on a disc. Come on, did you take the job or not? They're going to cut me out of the gator scene, make it look like an escape instead of a rescue. One minute that knucklehead will be spinning like a propeller underwater, and the next minute he'll be lying on the shore as if he got free from Alice all by himself. Mickey seemed more amused than upset. You said it yourself. Showbiz! You told them yes, didn't you? Son, we seriously need the dough. Well, who couldn't argue with that? He said, after what happened today, maybe Derek learned his lesson. Sure, and maybe the raccoons will start their own lacrosse team while his dad kicked the TV's star's shredded shorts into the cattails. Now go fetch a chicken from the freezer. Let's walk sweet old Alice back to her pen. Two chickens, Pop. She earned it. Chapter 9 That evening they drove down to Florida City and stocked up at the Walmart. Sodas, Gatorades, bug spray, sunblock, coffee, bacon, powdered eggs, granola bars, Pringles, frozen hot dogs, black beans, matches, and first aid supplies, including a bottle of 500 aspirins for Mickey. When they got to the register, Wahoo slipped ahead of his father and paid for the supplies with cash. Mickey eyed him warily. Where'd you get that money? Robbed a bank, Wahoo said. Actually, his mother had left $300 inside an envelope in his sock drawer for emergencies. Mickey said, don't be such a wise bleep. Okay, I didn't rob a bank. I won the lottery. I'm warning you. Here, grab a couple of these bags, Wahoo said. He promised his mom he wouldn't tell his dad about the cash in the drawer. They were loading the provisions onto the back of the pickup truck when Wahoo heard someone yell, call, Wait up! He turned around and saw Tuna Gordon, a girl from school. She had curly ginger hair and was small for her age, but she wasn't shy. Wahoo didn't know her well, although she had caught his attention in biology class because she knew the Latin names of all the local snakes and lizards. I need a ride, Tuna said. She wore a camo weather jacket, blue jeans, and bright green flip-flops. Her canvas tote bag looked as if it weighed more than she did. This a friend of yours? Mickey asked Wahoo. She's in my biology class. Algebra too, said Tuna. Wahoo's father was looking at the tote bag. Which way are you heading, hon? Anywhere, she said, anywhere, she said, wherever you guys are going. When she stepped closer, they saw she had a black eye. Who did that to you? Mickey gasped. I fell down the stairs. Baloney. Then never mind, Tuna said and turned to walk away. Hold on. Wahoo motioned her to come back. He didn't know what to say or how to act. Who in the world would hit a girl? He wondered. His father asked Tuna where she lived. She pointed toward a dented old Winnebago at the far end of the parking lot. Okay, but where do you keep it? Mickey asked. Right there. You live at Walmart? They let the motorhome stay for free, Tuna explained. We got electric and water and everything we need. It's not so awful. Mickey's father shook his head. If you like camping in a parking lot... Well, who knew Tuna was telling the truth? In fifth grade, he'd met a boy who had spent a whole summer with his family towing a Gulfstream trailer from one Walmart store to another, all the way from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to Portland, Oregon. What really happened to your eye? I told you, I fell down. Mickey said, that's bull. Somebody slugged her. Tuna's, Tuna's cheeks turned red. Wahoo was shocked that his father would say, say it aloud and embarrassed for Tuna that it was probably true. Mickey bent down and whispered, Was it your old man? Tuna pulled away. So what if it was? Has he been drinking tonight? Her eyes welled up. Every damn night, she said quietly. Where's your mom? Wahoo asked. Tuna covered up a sniffle. Up north with my grandma. 
Mickey Cray was staring darkly across the parking lot at the Winnebago, and Wahoo knew he was considering paying Mr. Gordon a visit. Such a confrontation could only end badly with police cars and ambulances. Wahoo's father had absolutely no use for creeps who beat on small animals, especially kids. You're coming with us, Wahoo said to Tuna, on a real camping trip. Her eyes brightened. Seriously? We're heading out to the Everglades for a few days. Sweet, Mickey said. I'll be right back and started striding toward the camper where Tuna's father was drinking. Wahoo ran up and cut in front of him. No, don't. He's got a gun, Tuna said, by the way. Mickey frowned. Then somebody better take it away from him. Stay out of it, Pop. She's safe now. Wahoo unclenched his father's right hand and pressed a $20 bill into it. What the bleep is this for? Now that we've got company, we'll need more food for the trip, Wahoo said. He looked over at Tuna. You like Coke or Mountain Dew? Anything's good, she said. Wahoo gave his father another five bucks. Mountain Dew it is. Mickey shoved the cash in his pocket and muttered, you two wait in the pickup. Then he trudged back toward the Walmart. Wahoo kept an eye on him to make sure he didn't make a detour to Mr. Gordon's RV. Once they were seated in the truck, Tuna said, look, I don't want to mess up your vacation. It's not a vacation, it's a job, said Wahoo. What kind of job? When he told her, she didn't believe him. Swaddled in his fluffy purple robe, Derek Badger watched the replay of the alligator scene over and over. Crikey, this is golden, he murmured. Raven Stark sat beside the director at a small dining counter in Derek's motor coach. A map of the Everglades was spread in front of them. Have you arranged for a chopper yet? Derek called from his bed. It's on my list, Raven said patiently. Derek loved using helicopters to shoot high aerial scenes of himself traipsing through the bush, making it appear as if he were all alone. The key was to find a place where there were no obvious signs of human habitation. Fortunately, the Everglades covered a vast region, and much of it was remote. Where's the new script? Derek demanded. The writers are still working on it, the director said. I want fresh pages by tomorrow morning. Understood? The pages were being rewritten to put the gator attack at the very end of the show. Because the scene was so brief and would have shown, it would be shown several times in slow motion and dragged out to fill the last 10 minutes of the program. For the earlier part of the show, the director would need other videotape segments. Derek hacking his way through the sawgrass, building a campsite, and, of course, cooking some poor luckless creature for supper. What about using your face to face with a snapping turtle, the director asked. It's really not so bad. I told you to erase that, Derek exploded. All right, consider it done, the director said. Although he had no intention of destroying the turtle tape, the nose nipping scene would be digitally added to a secret DVD of Derek's spectacular blunders that would be played on a giant flat screen when the crew of Expedition Survival held its annu annual end of the season party, which Derek never attended because he considered himself to be too important. The DVD was always the high point of the evening. Even Raven fa had found herself weeping with laughter. She wasn't laughing now, scanning the map of the Everglades. At first, the Miccosukee tribe had agreed to let Expedition Survival base its operations at one of the, its settlements along the Tamiami, uh, Tamiami Trail. Unfortunately, Raven had just been informed by a tribal lawyer that Mr. Badger and his crew were no longer welcome. Because of the incident involving the Navajos, the attorney had explained stiffly, we found out about it on the internet. Raven had grimaced at that at the memory. Derek had been doing a cave camping scene in New Mexico when he brainlessly decided to use an incident, an ancient Navajo prayer pipe to scratch an itch on his back. The sacred relic had snapped into three pieces, greatly upsetting the tribal leaders. Derek had been ordered to depart the reservation and never return. Now, on the eve of the Everglades taping, Raven was scrambling to find a new place to use his headquarters. The director tapped a place on the map. What about da what about here, down in Flamingo? Raven frowned. That's in the National Park. So what? Call him. I think we're on some sort of blacklist. You're joking, the director said, because of what happened at Yellowstone? Geez, that was three, four years ago. Not my fault, Derek protested from the folds of his robe. I didn't know it was a bloody eagle nest. 
that wasn't true. Everyone on the set had warned him it was an eagle nest. Before climbing the old cottonwood, he'd strapped on his helmet cam, thereby making sure that the whole idiotic crime had been recorded. A park ranger who had arrived during the fiasco retrieved the eagle egg as soon as Derek descended from the tree, depriving the survivalist of a tasty breakfast omelet and possibly a prison term. For disturbing a federally protected species, Derek had been slapped with a $10,000 fine that was hastily paid by the producers of Expedition Survival. Miraculously, the story had never leaked out to the media. Everglades National Park was a long way from Yellowstone, so it seemed impossible to Derek's director that the authorities in Florida were unaware of the nest dropping uh, in its incident. Fine, Raven said, I'll call the park superintendent and give it a shot. Her lack of enthusiasm annoyed Derek. Be sure and tell them we're the number one rated survival show on TV. Right. Broadcast twice weekly across all eight continents. Eight continents, whispered the director. Raven put a finger to her lips. Let it go. Derek beckoned them both to his bedside. This is pure gold, he said, touching the replay button again and setting the alligator scene in motion. It's a once in a lifetime near death experience. Neither Raven nor the director could disagree. If it weren't for Mickey Cray, Derek probably wouldn't have survived the struggle with Alice. The rest of the show, he said dreamily, must all build up to this incredible, heart-stopping moment. We'll spare no expense. Raven waited for Derek to finish savoring the replay so that she would have his full attention. She said, Mr. Cray would like to know which animals to bring along when we go to on location. Tell him not to bring any. But no tame animals, darling. This time we're going totally raw and wild. Raven glanced apprehensively at the director who said to Derek, why not have a few ringers handy just for backup? They've got a gimpy bobcat that I'm sure we could use in a scene or two. No more faking it, mate. From now on, we're putting the real back in reality. Raven didn't like the sound of that. Derek basked on the bed like a walrus, jowly and content. Surely our talented Mr. Cray can track down some Beasties for me to tangle with in the deep, dark Everglades, he said. I'm totally psyched about this show, aren't you? The director was at the opposite of psyched. Surviving the alligator scare obviously had inflated Derek's already bloated ego and filled his head with foolish notions. But what if we don't come across any wild animals, the director asked. Then we basically got 50 minutes of you schlepping through the muck. From somewhere inside his robe, Derek produced a sprinkle-covered donut and crammed it in his cheeks. No worries. Cray and his lad will come through. God knows we're paying him enough. Raven went outside to think. The director caught up with her by the primate pen, a safe distance from the motor coach. There was no way Derek could hear them over the shrill din of the monkey chatter. I'm not loving this scenario, the director confided. Me neither, Raven said grimly. That's his third donut since lunch. Pretty soon he'll be too fat to fit in his, his khakis. No, it's the show I'm worried about. We've never done with strictly one with strictly wild animals. Raven decided to be positive. This is just a phase. Derek will come into his senses. If, if he doesn't, then everything depends on that crazy redneck, and he's not exactly a charter member of the Derek fan club. Think positive, Raven said. At that moment, a disgusting glop of something flew out of the monkey pen and splatted in her hair. You have got to be kidding, she said. The director ran for cover as the monkeys threw more, yowling uproariously. And this is where we'll stop today.